Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca. I'm a fish biologist and ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lower cards catfishes. So today I'm going to do kind of almost like a jaw video. So I'm going to talk about keeping discus singly, uh, slightly almost in pairs and also introducing my new discus that is not going to show himself. So uh, people might have noticed that I've had one discus in this tank for a few months and previously I, well for a long time I've had pairs and also groups and I kind of just in this sort of size tank and on the situation I prefer pairs uh, more than often when I keep a group they will pair up and then that causes drama so that's kind of why I lean more towards having a pair which can be a little bit more of a drama than many people might think so can discus be housed alone and I'm actually going to say no especially if you're new to discus by a group, it's better to keep a group when you're starting out just to learn about the fishes, learn about their behaviour um, you're probably going to get them pair off but ideally I think also with discus it's kind of a good idea to have somewhere that you can move fishes around or maybe move a pair around so it's really a sort of a nuanced sort of a complex actual topic because it's not got that simple answer and I come from that side of having different style groups and pairs but I definitely wouldn't keep them alone long term so discus are well known for being shoaling in the wild and this is true they do shoal in the wild but they are also found singularly in the wild as has been noted in the scientific literature and by people that have seen them in the wild uh, particularly at night, individuals um, who might not be in the shore, maybe they're not pairing at the moment or for some other reason, they will be going around on their own. So that does mean that they're not always that sort of tetra-like shoaling fishes. They're a lot more complex than that. And if you understand discus, then you'll know they're a lot more complex than that commonly shoaling fish. But they can also be housed in pairs, as many will know, like most cichlids. Uh, they will, uh, they spawn in pairs, they uh, build a pair and then they spawn in it. With keeping a group together, you, because like most cichlids they defend that space, it does cause quite a bit of drama. Also within that pair, so that pair is not always entirely uh, loyal to each other as you might think. I don't think there's any cichlid that is. So you will get, and I've had it before, where a male has actually decided to actually wants this other female and his original female is still trying to pair with him but he's pairing with another one and then that has that drama. So housing discus is a little bit more complex than sometimes it seems. So housing alone, I would never recommend buying one discus and housing it alone. If you're going to house a discus alone, it should be for certain circumstances. And that is largely where you know it's a confident fish. So mine was out all the time interacting with me, almost like having a singular angel fish, which is also partially a shoaling fish. Or well, it is a shoaling fish, but also pairs up and potentially can go singularly. Um, so you want to know it's confident. Discus can be very easy to spook, very shy fish. They don't, well often they won't work on their own and particularly if you have a baby, like a small individual, they can be a lot easier to spook. So you have to know the personality of that fish. As social fishes, they're gonna get so much more um, enrichment, uh, sort of behavior, from being in the group, they benefit from being in the group and a group is more or less six plus. In the wild they are found in much larger groups, in much smaller groups and it varies a lot. They're kind of a little bit more fluid in those terms. So ideally it would be a group that kind of works down to less than that. And I don't recommend it for beginners at all. You kind of have to understand discus and understand your individual discus fish because they each have their own personality. This is a very um, boisterous female. When I got her, she was pretty much one of the most boisterous in the tank. And when I placed her with a male, she was a little bit more boisterous than him, even though he was bigger than her. 
So I kind of know her personality and when he passed away, it just left her which was kind of the problem. And you could say, I'll buy a shawl, and then it kind of becomes that cycle of, then I'd have to put the rest of the shawl in there, but what if some, well, individuals in that shawl are gonna pair up, and then it just becomes a little bit more complex, and rehoming discus is a little bit more complicated than it seems, especially to find good homes, and you don't wanna just, and yeah, it's a little bit more of a drama. So I kind of, I started with a pair, well, I've had shawls and then I did buy a pair and understanding the pair kind of taught me a lot about them. But there is ways of like I have buying individuals of either sex and pairing them up and it's not easy and you kind of need a tank to put others into if it kind of doesn't work out because if it doesn't work out, it won't work out. Uh, in some time or in some days or months and even if you have a discus pair so you say I want one tank and I want discus so I'm going to buy a pair pairs can still fall out I have had pairs fall out so they will uh, just one day they not don't want to be housed together one will chase the other into a corner and that's not going to work out so I've had to take one out and place in another tank and then maybe try and reintroduce them so it's understanding this behaviour and what is full on aggression, what's a bit of dominance and that sort of individual sort of aspects to it. So pairing them up is a lot more drama because you might end up with a fish that you can't house. And generally it's accepted with discus, they will do male-female pairs as sort of expected of fishes. So male-female pairs do work, but also it's not rare to find female-female pairs. And I've never tried pairing up a female-female. Um, but also, I don't really, I'm not too fussed on breeding them. So when it comes to sexing discus, you can, can't, you can be almost, like, let's say, 80% um, sort of like, that is male, that's female. And then there is some sort of flexibility till they spawn because you could end up with two females laying eggs and they're not really, it's not going to go anywhere so you have to wait till they can get that successful batch. So sexing is the difficult thing with this so I don't really explain how I do it particularly because it's kind of this judgement of I, there's some really easy varieties to go for if you aren't too great on looking at individual features so that would be something like the red covers in the red covers the males have a blue tinge they're a little bit more um they're a little bit more brown i guess they've got the blue to the head blue rim uh, and then the females are just this bright red coloration um which makes them really easy to sex in comparison to other varieties which there isn't really any uh, colour dimorphism. So that's probably an easy way. I look at fin shape so I kind of use a bit of a combination of looking at this anal fin and the dorsal fin. It's going to be more rounded than females most often. It's not going to have any trailers. You want a larger more mature fish otherwise it's a little bit hit and miss. And I could be totally wrong, and this could be two females. Um, the coloration kind of threw me on this one because it's not like a normal red cover. Um, but so this is the uh, leopard, leopard turk, um, or just the leopard anyway, but not the highest quality, but she's got those very rounded uh, edges to the dorsal and the anal fin. That kind of hints that it's a female to me. In more mature fishes and as they age, males do get quite a large nuchal hump, but then females can get a little bit of one depending on what they're fed. Males, I'd expect those fins to be a lot more pointed and maybe more of a nuchal hump, but there's a little bit of variation. So it's almost like a judgment of exposure. The more discus you see, the more you get used to noticing the differences and there's so much variation when it comes to sexing discus. So what I do, so I never personally have, like in my personal tanks, I've kept some of the larger cichlids, but you do see different pairing methods when it comes to them. And I'm used to sort of bonding uh, when it comes to 
introducing other animals to each other. So it's kind of using those skills when introducing them. Um, I, in theory, I would, if I could, use a divider. But these guys aren't going to do a hell of a lot of damage in one go, like some of those larger cichlids, like some of those more boisterous cichlids. So it's more just observing from a distance and seeing if they're going to work out because they can't really do that much rapid damage to each other. So realistically, when it comes to pairing them, I just add them. Um, just add them in and just watch. So... Where, where, as I've said, when discus don't get on as a pair, one will be chasing the other, and it happens in groups as well, where you'll see that really persistent chasing, making sure that one fish is in the corner, um, making sure that one fish isn't uh, getting as much food, is very much sort of bullying in a way. So when it does work out, there will be some dominance, there will be behaviours like increasing the... the when they, I think it's a dominance thing, but discus will sort of raise their dorsal and their anal fin to kind of make themselves look bigger. And yeah, that's a little bit of aggression, but you can't really see it too much. But she just basically told him, get out of the way. And that does happen. So pairs will have a little bit of aggression, dominance behavior. One will be telling the other, and it can be both ways. I've seen females when... Uh, one of the pair is spawning, the females being that, uh, telling off the male, and I've seen vice versa. But the first sort of sign I thought for this pair particularly that was going to work was he is much more than her, and I really misjudged how large she was. I thought she was tiny, and I didn't realise how much she grew, because sometimes you just think your fishes don't grow, and then you go to the store and get another, and it's like, ah! Oh, maybe they did grow. Um, but he went straight past her and kind of displayed and she backed off a little bit, which to me is a good sign because the worry was more of her being much larger and therefore potentially having a little bit more dominance. But discus are quite complex. They're very individual fishes, so there's many ways of doing it. And realistic, if you're going to introduce a pair, you just need to sit there and watch and be ready with the other tank. Oh to shove them into, to shove one into if you need to. And I've had that with bonded pairs that have laid eggs and stuff like that. And I've had it with one that, with groups and whatever they do, they're sicklers at the end of the day and they do fall out. So, although this guy is a little bit more elusive and he's probably a little bit more shy and with pairs you can expect that, Groups that tend to be a lot more confident uh, because they got that sort of, um, well, that group mentality. They're all going to sort of feed off each other when it comes to feeding and stuff like that. And he's very new to tanks, so he's not used to me. He's not used to me walking around. He's not particularly a fan of it, basically. But he does come out, it's just not when I'm standing here. But you can expect differences in personality and sometimes some will be quite shy when you're around the tank so I always recommend sitting from a distance. But it's one thing to consider you don't want these to be, well discus in general you don't want in a busy area because especially at first they're not used to it, they can spook and they can smash into the glass, they can yeah, so properly spook, spook into the environment. So if you saw any footage of him, he is actually, I believe, a San Maria, which is a variety I've wanted for a while, but I was like, oh, I'll never see them really. So these are related to red covers, but the barring, I believe, is very different. So barring is like the stress stripes that discus get when they're communicating. She gets them, um, sometimes it's quite obvious, you know, these uh, black bars on the body when she's in the dark, when she's a little bit stressed, and it's just that sort of communication. Pigeon bloods and some of our other varieties can't get them and they therefore pepper. I believe San Maria do, well he has slight barring on the head, so he's got that capability, but he's got that really intense red coloration that I've only really seen to a similar level in female red covers. 
but they are one of those more niche varieties and I didn't choose him for that. The sales tank was a little bit dark and I was like, I really would like a red cover again. I really like them. They're a little bit more natural to me. Whereas I got her because she was really nice, but not entirely my favorite, just the one that would have worked with the pair at the time. So when it comes to mixing discus, a lot of people think, oh, that'd be great if these two spawned. And I would definitely say no. So, I'm not into discus for breeding yet. I'd love to breed them. I have bred them. I'm not interested in raising the eggs or anything like that. But when it comes to mixing varieties, it comes with a whole load of drama of coloration. Just because they breed, it doesn't mean you're going to get this beautiful intermediate. You're probably not going to get something that's that desirable and therefore going to be able to sell that easily. Um, and also so many discus on the market, I don't think it's worth adding more to it. So I'm really not fussed about breeding them or how they breed. I really spooked them by smashing the lid a little bit. But also I did a water change and discus don't like cooler water water changes. But so I'm not really fussed on breeding discus to be honest. And that's why the setup is like this because if they lay eggs, I can more than expect her or anything in the tank to eat the eggs. If they don't eat the eggs, they're eating the fry. Um, so it's not really a concern of me, for me. They're just pet fishes at the end of the day. I've not kept them in any way that would be more um, for breeding. I've not really kept them in a way that I want to show them. They wouldn't be show quality anyway, I don't think. They're, I just like the rounder bodies of these Asian uh, discus. Um, even though they're probably closer to show quality than Stenko or anything like that, they don't have the pointy heads, they're still not um, for that. They're just pet fishes and that's what discus can be great as. A lot of people use other cichlids, I just like discus, they're almost like bigger pistogramma for me. But anyway, I end this video here and hopefully some of the footage of them is interesting and goodbye.